Hello everyone, welcome back to CSE 373. Today we are going to start our last day of algorithmic analysis. So we're gonna continue this discussion of recurrences, how to analyze recursive code, and we're gonna talk a little bit about cases where that master theorem that we learned on Monday um, won't work. And we're gonna learn a more gen general method called the tree method in, in this lecture. So a couple announcements before, before we begin. Uh, project one, DEX, is due tonight, uh, Wednesday, at 11.59 p uh, p.m. Seattle time. Um, make sure you add your partner to, on your Gradescope submission. So whenever you submit on Gradescope, you will see, you can see in this picture here, um, there's next to your name, there's add group member. And you should go add your partner to your submission. You have to do this, unfortunately, every time you make a submission. Each time you submit, it submits for yourself. And if you want to add your partner to your submission, you got to press that add group member button. Um, as a reminder, you do have late days uh, accessible. You know, stuff happens. Uh, you might not be able to finish Wednesday evening. Um, that's okay. You have late days available. So you have seven free late days you can use. It lets you turn in an assignment 24 hours late for the quarter. Um, and if you run out of late days, you can still turn assignments in late. Um, but it will cost a modest 5% deduction for that day afterwards. Unless you talk to the core staff about some, you know, ex extenuating circumstance. Um, and um, do remember, though, that no matter how many late days you have remaining, um, the late cutoff for any particular assignment is three days after the deadline. So that means if this assignment's due Wednesday night, you can't turn in the assignment uh, past Saturday night. Um, and do remember, if you're working with a partner using a late day, on a partner project uses one late day from each partner. Um, and please don't forget, there is a part of this project that is writing up your experiments. There is a separate submission on Gradescope for that. So there's two assignments you have to turn in for project part one. One is the project code, which you turn in like part zero. And then the other is uh, turning in your experiment report, which again, you should also add your partner to on your submission. Other announcements for dates coming up. Our first exercise practicing that algorithmic analysis tool chain we learned last week um, is due this Friday, uh, 1016 at 11.59 p.m. And on Friday, we'll also be releasing the next project and exercise. Now, the next pro I know the project has been coming out really quickly. We're going to start getting to the point where we're on two-week projects. So Project 2 Maps uh, is coming out this Friday, but it's not due for two weeks. Uh, but the exercise that is coming out is due the Friday after. I've already opened up the partner pool for... For project part two so if you're interested in finding a different partner um, you could definitely do it on your own using that search for partners um, discord channel uh, but we can also match you if you fill out that partner pool to pool um, you're more than welcome and maybe even encouraged to stick with the same partner that you had for p1 if, if you enjoyed working with that person there's no need for you to submit this pool again if you already want to be with the person you've uh that you're worth uh, but if you do want a new partner we can help you find one with the partner pool also, I want to mention this lecture in particular is going to be a little bit more mathier than some of the others. You might, wait, we did all that big O stuff. How could it possibly get more mathy? It gets a little bit more mathy. Um, but don't worry. A lot of the things we're showing you today were not things we have to prove, not things that we have to understand why they're true. And we actually give you like a cheat sheet of all of these like useful things called summation identities that you're going to want to use uh, when trying to solve these types of problems. So it's more of a knowing how, how to use the tool, not why the tool is true. Um, but we just provide this to you. And you're going to find this really useful. You'll see it on the calendar. Okay, so today's lecture, we have three big learning objectives. So first, we're kind of continuing that lear one learning objective from Monday's class. Um, we want you to be able to describe the three most common recursive patterns and identify whether code belongs to one of them. We also then want you to be able to model a recurrence with the tree method and use it to characterize the occurrence with a bound. So using the tree method to come up with an asymptotic bound. And we want you to be able to use summation identities to find closed form solutions for summation. So we're gonna be doing a lot of sums today and we have some clever tricks to take those sums and turn them into a closed form formula. Again, a non-objective for today, something we don't want you getting out of this class is how to come up with or explain summation identities on your own. We give all the ones you need to you as a given, and it's then it's going to be kind of like a puzzle. Like here are the available pieces you can use. Use that to try to solve the overall puzzle. So again, we're not, we don't need to understand why these identities are true. We are just going to take them for granted. 
So before we dive into what does today's lecture look like, I want to do a bit of a recap in this video about what we saw on Monday. Um, on Monday, we, talk, we started talking about writing recurrences. Well, when it came to analyzing recursive code, we wanted to count how many steps uh, was used in order to come up with our code model. And then with that code model, we can then do asymptotic analysis to get a big O, big theta, or big omega bound. For the most part, counting these steps is exactly what we did before. However, we now need to somehow come up with a way of accounting for recursion. So the way we did this was we came up with the idea of a recurrence. A recurrence is a fancy function that basically um, is an if statement and also allows recursion inside that function. So we came up with this t function that describes the runtime of the code. And we use t to say that it's a recurrence. So t of n is a function that describes for any input size n how many steps it will take to run. And we said, okay, well, for the base case, there's something like two steps there. That's straightforward. We don't need to worry about that. So it's two steps if n is less than three. And then we have a recursive case where we add up our non-recursive work, the code that's not about recursion. So we have a for loop that loops n times. We have some return statement that's like constant work. So our non-recursive work here is plus n plus three. And then we need to count up our recursive work. So how much work does the actual calls of recursion take? And we use, again, our recurrence that we are defining right now to figure out, well, how many steps will it take if we give it one third of the input? That's how we know it's t of n divided by three. And we call this method three times, which is why there's a times three at the front. And so our overall function is three times t of n over three, all plus n. We ignore that plus three or any of that other constant work because those constants aren't gonna matter. Um, what really matters is just kind of the scale that that non-recursive work uh, grows at. And it's actually a bit confusing at first when we think about this. I wanted to highlight part of this document why we include non-recursive work in our recursive case. The base case, I think, is pretty simple enough to justify why we separate that. But what we define as the recursive case is everything after your base case. And usually, the bulk of the work can happen in this non-recursive code, code that's directly outside of calling a recursive function. So you'll see when you have these, uh, when we see these common uh, patterns or um, using recurrences that when you have these loops or maybe if you have nested loops here that go along with a recursion it tends to be that loop code that's really dominating a lot of the workload so here this o of n loop that runs on each recursive call you know an n is changing each each method call because it's getting smaller and smaller as we recurse but that loop itself is actually contributing a significant amount to the overall runtime and so it's really important for us to add that workload into our recursive case, in the case that is recursing. So in our recurrence, we can now apply master theorem to figure out that asymptotic bound. So yeah, it's important to kind of recognize that usually it's, the recursion does incur some uh, steps and some slowdown of just, you know, making these recursive calls, but generally it's kind of the work you're doing outside the recursion that really determines the runtime. And we introduced this idea of master theorem, where if you, once you come up with this recurrence, if your recurrence is in a very particular form, where it's like a times the function t, where you pass in n divided by b, and then plus some other work that's uh, some function, uh, some bounded by big theta of n to the c, um, if it's exactly in that format, then you can use master theorem and just plug and chug these constants in, and it will output a big theta bound. And a lot of really good questions we got in lecture on Monday or sorry, in class on Monday, was about like, well, what if I had my recurrence relation in a slightly different form? Like, what if instead of dividing by something, I subtracted something or passed in different inputs each time? Master theorem is just not gonna work there. Master theorem, for despite how humbly it's been named, it only works in this one very specific narrow circumstance. Um, it really only works in this one case and it has nothing to say about anything else. And so that's going to actually motivate why we need this new general system called the tree method. So yeah, master theorem does look weird at first, but really it just works in this one context. You plug in the numbers and it pops up the answer. And so you'll find those practice problems from Monday session very useful if, you, if you're a bit confused by this. Now, one of the things we introduced in Monday's like, uh, lesson, again, this lecture outline was from Monday, 
Um, we also introduced, went in this context of different recursive patterns, we first introduced binary search, which we called the having the input pattern. Each time we have the input, I made one recursive call. In the second case, we talked about this thing called constant size input. So in merge sort, um, whenever you did these recursive calls, in some sense, across all of the calls at any level, the top level calls the next level, and each one of those makes another call. But if you look across all of the calls at one le level, the input size doesn't change. It's constant at each level. That's why we call this a constant size input. And do remember a non-learning objective for this slide was understanding what merge sort was doing or how it works. That's week eight. We'll come back to it, I promise. We just wanted to show you there's this real life algorithm that we can use master theorem on and recurrences to analyze. So this is a kind of another type where you divide the input in half, but you recurse twice. That was kind of the big idea here. And in that sense, it's a really constant size uh, input. And we also introduced, you know, you could still use master theorem on this. Once you come up with a recurrence, you plug in the numbers, assuming it's in the right form, and it gets out, oh, it's n log n. If you have heard of merge sort before, you know that its runtime is n log n. And then we just re-derive that fact uh, just by looking at the recurrence, which is pretty cool. And this is really kind of summing up what we've done so far. We're looking at the exact same picture as before. We're still looking at a tool chain for algorithmic analysis, but now we've introduced new tools for you. In the code modeling, modeling section, step one, last week we introduced case analysis, which is a new tool that lets you analyze code and coming up with different run funct runtime functions for different inputs. Now we've added yet another tool here, whereas if that code's recursive, that runtime function can be in the form of a recurrence. And if it's in the form of a recurrence, it's really not clear, just looking at that equation, what's the asymptotic bounds for that, which is then why we introduced Master Theorem. Master Theorem is your step tool, step two. It's your asymptotic analysis tool for when you're working with recurrences. Um, and it will just spit out what's the big O, uh, what's the big theta, what's the big omega. In our context, Master Theorem only told us big theta, but remember, if big theta exists, then you already know what its big O and big omega will be because of the definition of big theta. Now, for the rest of these uh, videos, we're gonna be talking about this third recursive pattern that we call doubling the input. And that's gonna be a bit uh, uh, hazy right now, but we'll come back to it in, a, in the next video. So we're gonna be talking about this problem uh, or this mathematical idea called Fibonacci or something very close to that. But I'm going to leave that for our next videos.